أبدا لن أنسى إسلامي لن أبقى في ليل ظلامي وسأبغ الفجر لأيامي وأطبق ديني ونظامي وأطبق ديني ونظامي كي يظهر نور الإسلام فالدنيا قد ملئت نورا وغدت أيامي ديجورا صارت بالباطل تنورا ونعيش بجهل وقتام والحل بدين الإسلام إسلامي ما كان بغيا ليكون عن الحكم قصيا بل كان نظاما قدسيا من عندي لا إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة All oh, praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gave us life to fulfill a purpose a purpose that differentiates us between the disbelievers and that is to single out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his lordship his worship and in his names and attributes this is something that we find many Muslims having a defect in last week we discussed the issue that many Muslims fall into and that is the shirk of voting in a democratic election and we discuss people falling into two groups فمنهم من هدى الله ومنهم من حقت عليه الضلالة from them are those who are guided and from them are those who deserve to be misguided because of the corruption in their hearts by following their desires we spoke about the messengers and how we have to believe in all of them. The messengers are from the offsprings of Adam alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he instructed the humans and the jinns to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he didn't make from the jinn a messenger. He didn't make from the jinn a messenger but there were warners from amongst the jinns وَإِذْ صَرَفْنَا إِلَيْكَ نَفَرًا مِنَ الْجِنِّ يَسْتَمِعُونَ الْقُرْآنِ فَلَمَّا حَضَرُوهُ قَالُوا أَنْسِتُوا فَلَمَّا قُضِيَ وَلَّوْا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِمْ مُنْذِرِينَ a group of jinns came and listened to the Quran so when they came to listen to it they said be silent then when it was finished, they turned back to their people, warning them. They turned back to their people 
warning them. So when the jinns, they heard the Quran, they returned back to their people and said, قَالُوا يَا قَوْمَنَا إِنَّا سَمِعْنَا كِتَابًا أُنزِلَ مِنْ بَعْدِ مُوسَى مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ They said, O oh, our people, verily we have heard a book sent down after Musa. They didn't say a book revealed to them as in the jinns or to a prophet from amongst the jinns. Rather, they said a book revealed after Musa. And this is the proof that no messenger or prophet was amongst the jinns. They are accountable just like the jinns. Just like humankind, the jinns are accountable. They're commanded to follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they didn't have a messenger amongst them, rather they had warners. And a warner takes from the messengers and conveys the message to the people from what he heard from the messengers. And a question arises, what is the difference between a messenger and a prophet? The difference between the messengers and the prophet is that the messengers are commanded to convey the sharia ah that was sent to them, meaning the books specifically revealed to them. And the evidence for this is found in the Quran. Verily, we have sent the messengers with proofs and we sent with them Al-Kitab. Here the word Al-Kitab, it includes all the books revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the messengers for mankind to be guided through them. And these books, they direct you to what benefits you in this life and in the hereafter. As for the prophets, no specific book came to them. Rather, they conveyed the previous shara'i. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Inna anzalna tawrata fiha hudan wa nuh wa nuh. يَحْكُمُ بِهَا النَّبِيُّونَ الَّذِينَ أَسْلَمُوا Verily we re revealed the Torah in it is guidance and light. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophets, they ruled by it. And the Prophets, they didn't deviate from the law of the Torah, nor did they change it or alter it. Musa Alaihi Salam, he was a messenger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he revealed the Torah to Musa. But the prophets of Bani Israel, Bani Israel, the children of Israel, they weren't sent no specific book, rather they judged by the Torah. So they all judged by the Torah that was sent to Musa. And the Injil, it was revealed to Isa and the Zabur was revealed to Dawood. So with this, we learn the difference between a messenger and a prophet. And every messenger is a prophet because the rank of a messenger is higher. And that's why the best of mankind are the prophets. And the best prophet are the messengers. So the best of the prophets are the messengers and the best messengers are ulul azm from the messengers allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us their names wa min nuhin wa ibrahim wa musa wa isa wa isa ibn maryam he mentioned them by their names wa id akhadna min al nabiyyin mithaqahum وَمِنْكْ وَمِنْ نُوحٍ وَإِبْرَاهِيمَ وَمُوسَى وَعِيسَى بْنِ مَرْيَمْ When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He took from the prophets, the covenant, and from you, Muhammad, 
عن نوح عن إبراهيم عن موسى عن إيسا so there are five and the best of them from the five was of course the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it's obligatory for every Muslim to believe that the prophets and messengers conveyed the message and they didn't leave nothing of goodness except they directed their ummah to it and they left no evil except they warned against it and this is something we find many of the Muslims today looking for a guidance other than the guidance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as I just said they didn't leave nothing of goodness except they directed their ummah, their ummah to it and they left no evil except they warned against it so whatever you see in the Quran that's prohibited or in the Sunnah know that the best of creation warned against this so whenever you see something and it doesn't match your logic or your desire know that the best man who walked on this earth knew better and the messengers they conveyed their message alam yatikum rusulun minkum yatluna alaykum ayati rabbikum wa yunzirunakum liqa'a yawmikum hadha qalu bala walakin haqqat alayhim ولكن حقت كلمة العذاب على الكافرين. Allah subhanahu wa taala mentions did they not come to you messengers from yourselves reciting to you the verses of your Lord warning you of the meeting of this day and they will say yes بلا. by that point it's too late. Because when you die, rejecting the Prophet وسلم, you die upon disbelief. You die facing a punishment that's eternal. So those who reject the truth, they'll be asked on the day of judgment, didn't a messenger come to you? And they'll admit it. And they'll say, yes, it did. A messenger came to us. So the message has been conveyed. And the important point to make here is that we need to submit to this message. Also, what's obligatory is that we believe in all the prophets, the ones that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about and the ones he didn't mention by name. So the messengers that were mentioned by name, we believe in them in detail. We believe in their life. We believe in everything they came with. As for the ones that weren't mentioned, we believe in them even though we don't know about them. And this is Iman. We're discussing the pillars of Iman. Sometimes you have to believe in something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you that you can't see. Or it may go against your logic or even your desire, but you have to believe in it. And if we read the number of prophets, and messengers, there are 18 prophets mentioned in order in the Quran and 25 in total. So the fifth pillar of Iman, which is the topic today, is the day of judgment. Al-Yawm Al-Akhir. Al-Iman Bil-Yawm Al-Akhir. Belief in the day of judgment. And it's called why? Because it comes after the ending of the dunya. It comes after the ending of this dunya. This dunya that comes with many trials and tests. Things that you face on a daily basis. From the time you reach adulthood to the time you die. And it's called Al Yawm Al Qiyamah. Because people will be standing. And it is called al yawm al-hisab and yawm al-deen because mankind will be judged 
and accounted for. On that day, there's reward and punishments given out, meaning they're shown to you what you've done. So these names are taken from the situation of this day, a day where we will know the truth about ourselves. We would know whether we were sincere or whether we was of those who lied and it fell back on ourselves. And it has so many names because of the number of events that take place. And believing in the day of judgment means you have to believe in all of it. From the beginning. From the beginning till the end. Where we were placed in the grave. The blowing of the trumpet. The resurrection. The rewards and the punishments. The scales. Taking the book with your right hand. Or taking the book with your left hand. The Sarat. Jannah and nar and hellfire so a muslim has to believe in this day and believing in this day falls on the two levels al imanul jazim and a person cannot be a muslim except if he believes in this and the second level is al imanul rasikh and this is what fills the hearts and this has a great effect on the righteousness and steadfastness of the slave. And this is something that I want to speak about today. Believing in the day of judgment. How many of us honestly live like this? How many of us really sit down and reflect upon this day, the day of horror, the day that you have to face the facts, you have to face all the things you've done in this life. And believing in this correctly has a great effect on the righteousness and steadfastness of the slave. Every time he reminds himself of the day of judgment, his Iman increases, his situation becomes better, and he stays away from sins. Fear the day you'll be returned back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brothers and sisters in Islam, contemplate over your situation and look at yourself. And seriously question your daily life whether it goes hand in hand with this belief does it go hand in hand with believing in the day of judgment look at your character look at the way you live see how much you rem remember allah subhanahu wa ta'ala daily and when do you remember allah do you remember allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only when it's you're in a time of need or do you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the whole day until you meet death check your life out look at it and ask yourself isn't it time isn't it time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserve to be worshipped the one who created you the one who gave you life, the one who took, took you out of times where only you yourself know how deep this problem was, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took you out of it. Whether it was you're facing a prison sentence, or whether it was 
he was facing a marriage problem or you was facing some kind of trial, you lost your job and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaced it. Or you was going hard through hardship in your assignment and Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped you in that. Fear the day you'll be returned back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And every time you become heedless of this day, you waste yourself. You waste yourself in this dunya and this dunya becomes the main concern. And this will eventually destroy you. We see this today. We see this. Most Muslims living no different to the disbelievers. And I want brothers and sisters in Islam to focus on this issue which I'm going to mention as it is something that has come to my attention. And if we don't remind you of the seriousness of living like a disbeliever, living like someone who hasn't got no concern of the Akhirah for themselves or for their spouse or for their children, not reminding themselves of the day of judgment when going out of their houses, leading them to go to forbidden haram places. This is something that needs to be addressed today for our Muslim brothers and sisters to take this message home and ask yourself, when you leave your house, where do you regularly go? Do you go to the masjid? Is your day filled with remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so it can benefit you on Yawm al Qiyamah? Or is your day leading you to dress up for a purpose of a selfie? You might think how petty this sounds. But this is the situation of the Muslims today. Their day starts with a selfie and their night ends with a selfie. Taking pictures of yourself and sharing on social media platforms. Imagine this picture coming in front of your eyes on Yom Al Qiyamah. Ask yourself a sincere question, my brothers and sisters in Islam. A heart to heart question for my brothers. On Yom Al Qiyamah, would you be happy to see that selfie in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is this what we have become? as practicing Muslims where we forgot the reality of our purpose that our purpose has become waking up to a selfie and our night doesn't finish with tahajjud or salatul isha rather it finishes with a selfie is this what we become as practicing Muslims many brothers have come forward complaining to me regarding these things. Take this message to your family members and sit down with them. If you're a married man, remind yourself, you're responsible of your wives. You're not an animal. You didn't marry her just to fulfill your desire. As Muslims, we don't marry just to fulfill our desires. That's the disbelievers. That's how they get married. Because they get attracted to some skin. But as Muslims, we go beyond that. We get attracted to what? To what pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can't just let 
Your spouse do as they wish. For verily this will end in a divorce. It will start off nice. And then it ends up bitter. Because when a, one of the spouses, they wake up to, and smell the coffee, they realize they've married someone who has no concern about their hereafter. They've married a man or a woman who doesn't have no concern for what he or she does on his or the, her daily basis. And as for those who don't forbid their spouses from falling into haram, if you're scared of an argument today, most men, they get scared of falling into an argument. They've been married 10 years, 15 years, five years. And when you ask them, why don't you turn around and change your life around? They'll tell you, I don't want to get into an argument. Well, let me tell you one thing. If you're scared of an argument today, be scared of the day where you will have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for every action that you didn't prevent. So the second you allow your spouse to have Instagram and they post selfies of themselves, get ready to answer. Prepare yourself. Prepare yourself for the question of the grave. And prepare to stand on the day of judgment with them pictures getting shown to you. If you don't have no problem with your spouse walking around Harrods or Westfield for no reason, or just going out to any cat he likes or she likes to fill, fill their desire, to just waste their time, then wait for the day of questioning. This matter needs to be taken very seriously. This matter's led to many people divorcing each other. It's led to adultery. So face the real facts. For verily, the main reason for adultery has become because the spouses didn't have much concern about their hereafter. They didn't care where their husband goes. They didn't care where their husband works. They didn't care where their wife goes. She's just going out to shop. She's out the house for four hours, five hours, shopping. Is this life? Every other day? So if you don't awaken your hearts through seeking forgiveness and leaving these forbidden places, you'll waste yourself. You might be 20 now, 30, 40. I can guarantee you, it will come to a dead end. As many people it did. So the cure for this is to remember the day of judgment. Remind yourself that you'll be placed in the grave on your own without your father, without your mother, without your children, and without your spouse. Remind yourself, you have to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And remind yourself one thing, that all your actions will appear in front of your eyes on Yawm al -Qiyam. No one will be able to hide these actions except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So account yourself today and remind yourself there's a paradise waiting. A paradise more beautiful than this Western lifestyle that we see many Muslims living. A lifestyle that you wake up with, as I mentioned, a selfie. A selfie having breakfast, a selfie having lunch. Soon, we're going to see people doing selfie having zina. We've become so low 
Everything is getting accepted. Everything is getting accepted. So contemplate over this. I had to hear something yesterday from one brother that disgusted me. Disgusted me. But if we don't give you these real life scenarios, you'll think we're living in a fairy tale and we're just shouting for no reason or we're getting emotional and angry for no reason. But let me tell you the consequences of free mixing. The consequences of free mixing in your workplace where a brother, a brother, a trustworthy brother narrated a story, a real life story. It didn't happen in, in the middle of a zoo where you would think this would happen or a jungle. But it took place in London where if I can narrate it correctly, a sister goes to work and she turns around with one of our work colleagues. They go for lunch or whatever it may be. And what happens? They stop somewhere. And the man goes, why are we standing here for this amount of time? She goes, I'm waiting for my husband to go to work so I can bring you into my house. A married woman. And what's worse, after Zina gets conducted, this man starts playing with a kid. Imagine someone going to work, an innocent man going to earn a halal income and his wife, who is left home or left to go to work, turns around and does this disloyalty. This is the consequences of free mixing. And this is the consequences of fathers and husbands letting their wives go and work in a place where it's full of men that have no concern except to be an animal. So as I mentioned, account yourself. And the point of the matter was adultery, zina. How does it start? How it started from a, a workplace and it ends up like this. Account yourself and repent back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In next week's class, we'll discuss the situation for the one who receives the book in his right hand. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Okay, the first question. How should we approach to advise those who do such wrongdoing on social media? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you for conveying the message. How you convey the message is the most important part. And that is to ask yourself, the person that you're gonna convey it to, first and foremost, if you're a male, you are not burdened to advise a sister. Meaning you advise her directly on your own. Whether it's through DMs, you're not burdened with this. What you're burdened with is to advise either her father, her husband, 
or someone who's in charge of her. If you don't know them, then ask a female relative of yours, your mahram, who can approach them and give them kind words that may open their heart. وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ الذِّكْرَ تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ فَإِنَّ الذِّكْرَ تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ That if we remind them the dhikr, the, rem, the reminding them, the, the admonition, it will benefit the believer. And there are many sincere brothers and sisters who are challenged by the society and they feel that the only way they can express themselves is through either posting something on the internet which leads to be haram. For example, singing. Singing under the pretext of da'wah. This is incorrect. And there are brothers that do this. They sing or they do nasheeds under the pretext of da'wah. Da'wah is an ibadah. It is restricted. You do it the way the Prophet ﷺ did it, and the Prophet ﷺ never gave da'wah through nasheeds or singing. As for the woman, they give da'wah through selfies. And this is what's been brought to my attention, and it's the saddest thing to hear that we have our sisters who are supposed to be the gems for this ummah, and they are the gems of this ummah. But finding them on social media isn't the place to find them giving that one. So putting a picture of yourself, for example, and as what was brought to me yesterday, was that sisters tend to put pictures of themselves and what happens? They'll write a long caption or something mentioning Allah. Ask yourself sincerely this question. Would Aisha radiallahu an stand outside Mecca posing and asking the people to draw her while she speaks? Would you find the likes of the wives of the Prophet or the wives of the Sahaba doing anything like this? Well, life, you picture certain things. Sometimes we need to draw this picture to you to make you understand how how serious this is. Imagine the Sahaba, their wives or the Salaf of this Ummah, their wives or their sisters or their daughters or even their mothers, this is how bad it's become. Standing in front of the Kaaba or in front of Medina and asking someone to draw them because them times there wasn't cameras to draw whilst they're giving some poetry or they're giving some da'wah. Do you really think the da'wah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would have reached where it is right now through this? The only thing that's happened is the shaitan has beautified this corruption. And a sincere advice to my brothers and sisters in Islam, who are on social media. Know you are putting yourself in a deep ocean and you don't know how to swim. Just imagine yourself as someone. If I told you, would you put yourself in a deep ocean tomorrow and you had no swimming gear, how long would you last for until you drown? And that's what's happened. Brothers, it starts off with a back picture six months down the line he's got his biceps and he's got a caption saying Allah loves the one who is strong or the strong believer is better than the weak believer this is not the way of giving that word and that word was never given like this and as for the sisters you find them starting off with putting a picture for example, of a niqab, 
which the brother mentioned yesterday. He said that this has come to his attention. He wants me to advise in regard to this issue that there are apparently sisters who come. It starts off with a niqab six months down the line. They'll move on to a half niqab. And then after that, it becomes no hijab, uh, no niqab. And then five years down the line, no hijab. 10 years down the line, she believes in philosophy or atheism or whatever you want to call it. This is the trap. And this trap, wallahi, it will take you, as I said, in a deep ocean. You will drown, you're never to be seen again. Is it worth, is it worth sacrificing all that time, effort that you could spend in seeking knowledge and busying yourself with seeking knowledge? If you want to give da'wah, no one is preventing you. No one is preventing you from giving da'wah, but it has to be what Allah loves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't love you putting pictures of yourself in some flashy restaurant or in some wearing some flashy clothes or whatever you want to call it. This isn't going to call to the way of Aisha radiallahu an or Umar ibn Khattab. This is not going to take us towards the path of the Sahaba. If you want to give da'wah, do what they did. Read the books of history. Their history will never be forgotten till this day when someone hears Omar, they shake. Was Omar a Nasheed artist? Was Omar Amr al-Khattab a Nasheed artist? Was he someone who you can go up to and say, brother, mashallah, I like your post. You look good. You, you've got some nice eloquent words. Omar ibn Khattab was a man of honor and he took things seriously. Read the life of Omar. This is an advice to the men. Read the life of Omar ibn Khattab. Wallahi, he will make your manhood come back. And as for the woman, read the life of Aisha radiallahu anha, who she was, and that was the reason why Allah loved why, why Muhammad Sassam loved Aisha the most. So lastly, my advice is, do not go down that road of approaching a sister or a brother. If it's on social media, you see something wrong, do not go down that DM route. Do not DM her or him. Because you're playing games with yourself and you're going to ruin yourself and you're going to ruin her. How can we stop this trend of taking selfies? Remind yourself of the hadith. Kullu musawwirin finnar. Every picture taker is in the hellfire. And this is a topic that, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to speak about. For verily, taking pictures in and of itself of something that possesses a soul is not permissible. And the evidences will come in due time these are not logical evidences. These, will, these evidences will show you how serious this matter is, first and foremost. And second of all, how many people have misunderstood the concept of taking pictures. And the last question, Salaamu Alaikum. How should sisters do da'wah online? Because some sisters still insist to display, display their personal life routines and images of them in niqab. If you can't resist putting your picture, whether it be with a niqab, whether you're covered fully of yourself, on social media, go back to the second principle in Usul al falata First was to seek knowledge and then act upon it. And then da'wah. And this is something that sisters do and brothers do. They jump from number, from, they jump the gun and they move straight away, giving da'wah with no knowledge, no nothing, no ammunition. What they was upon, which was goodness, three years down the line, they see themselves worse than they 
but worse than entering the da'wah scene. So as for sisters, if they want to give da'wah, the social media is not the platform for da'wah if you can't resist yourself from taking pictures. Self, nurture yourself. Fix the heart first and then come out. For verily, taking pictures of yourself, whether you believe pictures is haram or halal, taking pictures and putting it in front of a thousand people or 10,000 people, this is not the characteristic of a da'i. Impossible. As I mentioned, you will never find Aisha radio an. You will never find Aisha radio an standing in front of the Kaaba and asking people to draw her, whether it be with a niqab or without a niqab, while she's giving poetry or while she's reciting the Quran or while she's commanding people to do good and forbidding them from evil. This is not the way of the Salaf and it should be avoided. So lastly, if you can't hold yourself from selfies, go back and fix the heart first. The heart needs fixing. And this is not an insult. This is not attacking no one. This is actually trying our hardest to save you from a day where all these things will appear in front of you. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our brothers and sisters return back to the right way and for us to seriously look at ourselves and ask ourselves what was the da'wah of the Prophet and the Sahaba and the Sahabiyat? I may take this last question, let me read it first. The last question, I don't know the answer. So inshallah, when I do find out the answer, I'll try my hardest to get back to it. Wa jazakum wa khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.